Okay, morning everybody, welcome to worship. Uh, it's lovely to have you join us. Uh, Zach and I are sat in the garden this morning, it's nice, isn't it? Let's start with uh, a word from Psalm 9, this is 1 and 2. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will, pr I will tell of all the marvellous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Amen. Um, it's lovely to uh, be able to worship together. Again, big thanks as always to Ross for putting all of this together. Um, it's a marvellous job that he's doing. Um, it's lovely to have my mum join us to bring God's word a little bit later on, uh, speaking on Philippians 1, 1 to 11. And, uh, oh, are you yawning or are you just opening your mouth? Shall we, um, shall we have a prayer as we commit our act of worship to God? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We ask that you be with us in all that we do this morning. Be in our worship, be in everything that we do. Thank you that we can meet with you and know your presence. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Our reading today is from Philippians 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Thanks be to God. Love is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice because if somebody was hurt or about to die, somebody might risk their life for them. That is love. Can you tell us anything else about love? Perhaps in your life, at home or? I think at school they give you love by, by well, by letting you learn, teaching us the right and wrongs of life. Anything else? What about at home? Your mum and dad look after you. And that's love. What about God's love? What's that like? That is more of a sacrifice. He lets you come with him. We show love to people. We show love to people by like being kind to them, being helpful, sometimes hugging, kissing. Um, also we show love to people by just generally being nice and... Is it always easy to love people? No, it's not always easy. Like if they've been mean to you in the past, like it's hard to love them and it says in the bible love your enemies and that's really hard and yeah now how could you love your enemy like you could love your enemy by being nice to them like 
talking to them and being helpful. Why do you think they're being mean to you anyway? Um, maybe sometimes it's because they're jealous of what you can do and they want to be able to do it but then they can't so they're mean to you. So do you need to understand what they're doing? Yeah, you do need to understand how they're feeling. How else can you learn about God's love? You can learn about God's love by like reading the Bible and praying to him. Well, you can also maybe show your love by going to church every Sunday. Maybe not every Sunday, but at least maybe frequently. Yeah, maybe like once a week. Go to church once a week. Oh yeah. Do you like, like being loved? Uh, um, it's really nice to know that you lo you're loved. By other like people. it would be a lot harder to know that I wasn't loved by other people. Yeah. Like not everyone loves the same person, but if they did love one person, I know it wouldn't be me. Who loves you, Fleur? My sister, my mum, my dad, dozens of people, and if they didn't like me, it wouldn't really feel like living because nobody loves you, all except from God. It would be a lot harder in life if we didn't have God because I'd be more scared of things and also... At when After life, you wouldn't really know what well, nothing would, would really happen after your life. Well, um... Oh, Flash. Love is about caring for people, I think. And it's about um, being kind. Yeah. What about God's love? Um, God's love, um, you can't measure it, um, you, it's, it's so big, it's beyond words, and that doesn't even prescri describe it, saying it's beyond words, um, it's big. Can we experience God's love? Yes, if you pray and read the Bible, um, you can experience it. How does that help? It helps with a lot of things. It helps with your confidence. It can help with um it can help with your like I don't know, exams maybe at school or um whatever. Um do you f ever feel God's love? You might do, yeah, if you're really focused and um really deep in prayer or something. And how can we experience God's love more or show God's love to other people? Um, you can be kind and caring or you could like tell them about God and his word. Thank you, Toby. So who would like to have more of God's love? Me. And perhaps anyone who's watching as well. But how do we get or grow in God's love? This gospel is going to remind us of you and anyone who's watching this service okay and then this jug is going to remind us of god's love and the red i'm going to put in now is going to remind us the blood that jesus shed for each of us for the forgiveness of sins so that's nice and red now I'll give that a bit of a... okay now Back to my question, how do we grow or get filled with God's love? Okay, so we get filled with God's love when we hear that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for our sins. Now, I want you to take your hand, can I hold it with my other one? Okay, we get filled more of God's love when we find out that he is a father to us and loves us like we are his children.
we get even more love when we find out that he is never going to leave us and is always there for us. Just pour the rest of God's love in there. So knowing and believing these truths are great ways for our love to grow. Mm -hmm. But have you ever wished that you had so much love that it would just pour over into other people's lives, like your friends' lives or your family's lives, or even others' lives you come into contact with? And this is what Paul was praying for, for the Philippians. He wanted their love to overflow. But how can that happen? In 1 Peter, Peter says, love one another deeply from the heart. And I think this kind of deep love can only happen through God's love, God's word, that's the Bible, and through prayer. Now, I'm going to put some yeast into this water. Okay. And yeast makes things grow, right? Like bread. Do you want to give that a stir, mother, then? Yeah. Okay, yeast makes things grow. So give it a good stir, stir up nice and good. That's it. Yeast water. Well done, keep stirring. Okay, so you think of the bread rising, that's the yeast in it making it grow. Oh. Keep stirring. Keep okay, now this yeast oh. is going to represent your prayers to God and reading the Bible to help your love grow so that it overflows to all those around you. Okay, how are we doing? Let's have a yeah, look. Right. Can I have a look? That looks good. Okay. So, careful, that's it. Let's add our prayers to what we already know is true about God and see what happens. This is the moment of truth. Hi. Look at that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> wow. It's all pink. Don't touch it though because that's that will be hot. Can that's... you see the steam coming off it? Yeah. Oh my oh, gosh. It's all pink. So wow. When God <laughs> fills us up with his love, it spills out of us and we can share that love with others. Oh my gosh. I want you to remember to continue to fill yourselves up with God's love through prayer cool. and by reading the Bible and listening to people who tell you about Jesus. When you do this, God's love will overflow to all you meet. Like that. Just like that. It's amazing. In Mary's induction, introduction last week, she commented on the words of blessing that so beautifully are displayed on the glass of Berniston Church's entrance. And I want to say how much I have appreciated those displays during these months of uncertainty. Having been in lockdown from March until June, I first noticed the Pentecost display, then the beautiful words of the blessing from number six. And now that familiar greeting from many of Paul's letters. The Lord bless you with love, hope, joy and peace. Can I add my personal thanks to all those responsible? What an amazing witness to both the village and to all who drive or walk past. I'm sure it warms the hearts of many as it has done for mine. The passage that I have chosen to look at this morning has links to your church's blessing and in different ways to all of the passages on this on prayer which have been shared during the previous 15 weeks of this study series of prayers in the Bible. Indeed, the first line links it immediately to the passage from 2 Timothy, a letter Paul wrote from prison to Timothy four years later in 65 AD, which Pam thought Ward shared thoughts on. Pam described her choice 
as not a prayer, but a letter full of the content of prayer. I would venture to suggest that this description can be applied to most, if not all, of Paul's letters. From verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Philippians, we learn that when Paul wrote these verses in 61 AD, Timothy was with him as a faithful companion during a period of house arrest in Rome. This passage also links to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, written in 60 AD, from which Paul Midgley preached on August the 30th, and thus indirectly again to Timothy, who Paul sent to Ephesus to guide the young church gathered there, and where he loyally stayed, tradition has it, until at the age of 63, Timothy was killed, trying to stop a pagan procession through that city. And so our reading begins, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the elders and deacons. Philippi, located in what is today's Greece, was a busy cosmopolitan city of a colony of the Roman Empire in the year 61 AD. The church Paul's letter addresses was the first church in all of Europe and was very close to Paul's heart. It was in Philippi, after all, during the second missionary journey that 12 years earlier, Paul and Silas had experienced their miraculous release from their chains after being thrown into jail on trumped up charges while staying with Lydia. After founding the church that first met on the banks of the river Gangites, but later met in Lydia's home. See Acts 16 if you want to know more. So in this letter, Paul was writing to an established and a growing church with appointed leaders and pastoral carers. Paul's greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, moves into thanksgiving and prayer. He writes, I thank my God every time I remember you, in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul's letter is so encouraging. He was writing to people he knew well. He loved and trusted for their faithfulness to Christ and their commitment to mission and service. The love, joy and affection he had for each member of this congregation shines through this letter. Every time he thought about the folk who made up the church of Philippi, he thanked God for them. Are there people you know who you thank God for every time you think of them? It's a good habit to get into. The term arrow prayers is often used to describe those little one-line prayers we shoot off to God at odd moments when a thought strikes us. We think of someone with thanksgiving or concern or joy and immediately 
that thought intentionally becomes a prayer. To borrow words written in 1818, a Scottish-born poet, James Montgomery, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from false ways while angels in their songs rejoice and cry the sinner prays. Paul's letter continues. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So here Paul lovingly reminds his readers that we all need and can share in the amazing grace of God. That grace that is freely offered to all people everywhere and was modelled by Jesus in his life and death when he resolutely turned his back on the way of violence, asking his followers to turn the other cheek, to forgive those that do us harm, to pray for our enemies, to walk away from conflict. Paul, like his master Jesus Christ, taught that all lives do matter. It had not been easy for Paul to change his thinking and come to realise that everyone was invited into this new Jesus movement. As many of the Jews still struggled to see how God could possibly want unclean and unworthy people to be part of his family. In Acts chapters 22 and 23, we read how Paul, sharing his testimony of his conversion, struggled to convince the Jews how Jesus had actually changed everything. And he tried to communicate how all were now welcome in God's house. But the strict Jews simply saw him as someone who was inciting hatred against them and plotted to kill him. Rabbi Gamaliel, a famous Pharisee, who was known for his strong commitment to the old ways of Judaism, had been Paul's rabbinic teacher. And from our very first meeting with Paul, then called Saul, we know he had learned to be strict and zealous in adherence to the rules of faith prevalent at that time. What an amazing conversion we witness in Paul. He came to Christ carrying a lot of both conscious and unconscious bias, as most of us do. But an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus enabled him to face up to his past with discernment and allow the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to work in him and through him. At the Yorkshire North and East District Synod, held by Zoom 
on September the 12th. We watched a very thought-provoking presentation by one of the chairs of the London district, the Reverend Dr. Jongi Zihili, a man full of grace. He was talking about understanding diversity and all its complexities. He shared how we each need to become aware of and acknowledge our own unconscious bias as we live out our discipleship in today's world and how we lovingly need to tackle difficult conversations together. I commend Jongi's talk to you. Synod was brilliant. I don't ever remember saying that before. We had excellent presentations. If you've got three hours, I would commend you watching the recording in its entirety. But if not, why not watch it in shorter chunks? I promise you, you won't be disappointed. It can be found on the district website and Facebook page and on YouTube. And it was lovely to see the opening worship led by the North Yorkshire Coast Circuit on the theme, The Earth is the Lord's and Everything in It, with Berniston's music group praising God with voices and instruments as the worship drew to its close. If we'd been able to sing today, I would have chosen the hymn which I quoted earlier. It has made it into Singing the Faith. It's number 529 if you wish to look it up. It goes on, Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, our watchword at the gates of death. We enter heaven with prayer. In the final three succinct verses of our reading, we come to Paul's prayer. He writes, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. O you by whom we come to prayer, by, oh, you by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer yourself have trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. So concludes the hymn. This series that we're following started way back on June the 7th with David Perry's thoughtful look at the Lord's Prayer as written in Matthew's Gospel. Week by week, day by day, we use that model prayer Jesus gave us. Hopefully, as G David advised, pausing to really understand and mean the words that we are praying. Before he gave us the Lord's Prayer, Jesus also advised his followers not to make a show of prayer, but to pray with simplicity. Using the message and reading from Matthew 6, verses 6 to 9, Jesus says, This is what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded space so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. This is your father you are dealing with. 
and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. All of Paul's prayers are short and to the point. So in closing, I again use words from the Eugene Peterson's interpretation of Paul's prayer. I pray that our love will flourish and grow as we learn to love appropriately, using our head and testing our feelings so that our love is sincere and intelligent and our lives circumspect and exemplary, bearing the fruits of the Spirit as we share our faith and move forward in love to the glory and praise of God. Amen. And so we turn to our prayers. Looking once more at uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, a few verses towards the end of the reading that we had this morning from verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we echo that prayer of Paul for our church here and now in the 21st century. We pray that both as church and individuals that we may truly abound in love for you and for one another. That we may grow in discipleship, in grace and in knowledge and that we would be your hands and your feet and your voice to communicate your loving gospel into our communities and the places in which we are. As a church here at Burniston, we pray for those decisions that need to be made regarding opening up or not opening. For those who are charged by church council uh, to make those decisions. We just pray that you give each of the stewards and the property team the wisdom and the knowledge about what we should do and the pace at which we should go. We pray for other churches in the area, for Christian communities wherever they are, that they truly may be your representatives and your disciples in your world. And so, Lord, help us to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to grow in your grace and in your knowledge as your church. And Father, we pray for your world. A world that we know is beset by so many problems. A world which you created to be good and yet is marred by human greed and by the lust for power. We pray for all those regions where there is conflict, that your peace would break out in those places. We pray for all those regions where there is want, where there is hunger and thirst, where there are unnecessary diseases. And we pray for all the agencies that seek to alleviate poverty and suffering wherever it may be. Particularly at this moment, we pray for all those regions that are suffering the ravages of COVID-19, especially those areas with underdeveloped healthcare systems. And for people everywhere for whom just the basics of soap and water so that they can wash their hands uh, are luxuries beyond their grasp. And Father, as we pray for your world, we focus down to our own nation, for those who are charged with governing this land. 
and we pray that you would indeed grant them wisdom so that they would govern with justice and equity for all people. Pray particularly as they struggle with the way forward to control the pandemic here in this land. And Father, we pray for all involved in, uh, in healthcare settings and that the message would really get across to people to be extra careful and vigilant. Father, we pray for the effect on family life, for all those who are concerned about the future, both at how they're going to meet with other members of the family, but also for those who are facing an unknown future because of job insecurity. We pray for businesses, that you would enable them to carry on in a safe and secure way. And Father, we pray for all those who are in need, particularly thinking about the elderly and the vulnerable and those who are shielding, but also all those who are suffering from illnesses, for those who are wanting to access um, medical facilities, but because of the COVID-19, they're finding that more difficult. For those who are waiting to undergo treatment. And Father, we do pray for all those who are involved in healthcare and key workers. We thank you for the way that you have used the NHS in this crisis and the fact that it wasn't overwhelmed during the first wave and Father, we pray for it ahead of any second wave. We pray for those who mourn. And in a moment of quiet, we lift before you people that we know that are in need of your special touch, a blessing at this time. And finally, gracious God, we pray for ourselves. Lord, you know each one of us. You know our needs, you know our desires, you know our aspirations. But Father, we pray that you would answer our needs according to your will and purpose for our life. But above all, gracious God, our prayer is the prayer that we started this section of prayers off with, that we would grow in grace and in knowledge and that we would grow ever closer to you. Draw us, gracious God, to your side. May we truly be your people. And may we know your Holy Spirit prompting us and guiding us. For Lord, we ask this and all our prayers. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.